My earliest memory of really getting into photography was probably growing up out of the lake and getting a camera probably, besides using my parents' old Argus where I'd look through the bottom, but getting my own, I think it was like an Instamatic probably back in the early 60s. And I remember just running around taking pictures of relatives, cousins, the lake, wanting to take pictures of the lake. I mean, just birds, the lake, and stuff like that. I always enjoyed not trying to take a posed picture, but more capturing a moment to share with the people I took with later. And that's my earliest recollection, is being a kid growing up at the lake, having a camera just running around taking pictures and driving everyone crazy. I can remember when I was a child out at the lake when the weather was really bad. It was time for my grandfather to, at that point, rip out the old home movies that he would take. They were old eight millimeter movies, basically with no sound, and they were, you know, stuff he took. And we would all sit by, and he would pull up the screen, and we would watch them on TV. Not TV back then, actually. It was either the wall, an old screen that they would pull down. Um, and the funny part was, after watching them, we would all insist that he would play them backwards so we could see everyone run backwards. And I just remember that always intrigued me, how he could just capture people doing stuff and later on look at it. I think the first camera I got was probably, that was my camera, not someone else's I had to borrow, was probably for my bar mitzvah in 1963. And I remember, you know, just opening the box, and I think it was a Kodak Instamatic or something like that. And I just, like, was, wow, you know, my own camera, and now I could just take pictures whenever I wanted. I didn't realize at that point you had to pay for film, but I learned real quick, you know. Uh, that was long before digital, long before anything like that. And I was basically running around taking pictures of family, friends, the lake, anything that I could take pictures of. And, you know, I didn't take too many posed photographs. I maybe took a few back of maybe, a, you know, family parties. But other than that, I never really cared about posed photographs. It never was an interest of mine. I remember, you know, a lot of times growing up when I was, oh man, I was young, Walter Cronkite would have on, you are there, or something like that. And I would sit and just watch that thing over and over and over. I really enjoyed just being taken to places that I couldn't go and just sitting there and watching it. And I remember to this day sitting in front of the TV, watching when Kennedy was shot. That just left an influence on me, just watching that and seeing how history was being captured. And it would be, I mean, basically forever saved. And we would see it over and over and over again. And after that, I learned about the Zapruder film, where I would look at that over over and over again. I mean, I could never watch it enough times. I would scour back then, and I still do Life Magazine, Time, anything with photographs. I just loved watching and looking at old photos. I always enjoyed photographers who could somehow take you there with them and you're there at that moment looking at that image that they saw. And if they've done that, then you know what? To me, they, their pictures told me the story. And that, to me, was always the bottom line. Well, I remember when I would ride, you know, in Farmington Hills, you know, I'm an avid mountain biker. And I would ride at the time from Sylvan Lake to Farmington Hills. And when I did, Farmington Hills was all dirt roads. There was no pavement. I mean, 13 mile was dirt. I would ride and just be amazed at all the trails I could ride on in the area. And as I moved here in the early 90s, I just was amazed at all the historical things that are in, that are in this area. Sylvan Lake, Farmington Hills, the little communities we have around here with the lakes. And I decided at that point that I wanted to start capturing some of the stuff and being able to share it with other people. Um, I've always enjoyed being able to show people 
my photography. The problem was the technology was never there other than just, you know, showing them this is my photograph. But now with the technology that's available, I could take all my historical stuff that I've shot for years, my nature photographs that I'm out doing now that I love doing. I love going out in the woods and Farmington Hills on some of the trails that I've discovered and going out and shooting the nature. And then when I go to an assisted living center or I go to see some handicapped adults or children and I show them one of my photo montages and I take them through the nature trail and they look at me, they go, where is that? And I go, it's Farmington Hills. They go, no way. And then they see the deer and they see the animals. They see the turkey vultures. They see the raccoons. They go, where is this? I mean, is this up north? Is this? I tell them, no, it's Farmington Hills. And they say, you gotta be kidding me. And I mean, they see the deer, they go, my God, I can't believe this is Farmington Hills. Well, we live in a great community. Pe people just don't realize the nature that surrounds us. All they see when they drive is office buildings and streets. They don't stop to smell the flowers. They don't stop to see the deer. They don't stop to see the raccoons, except when you know, they chase them out of their garbage cans. So what I decided to do is take handicapped children, take adults who can't do it anymore. And I'm taking them through Farmington Hills. I'm taking them through the nature trail. I'm taking them through some of the historical houses. It's about being able to you know, give back a little to people who probably have been lost in our society. Because when I go into these nursing homes, assisted living centers, senior living centers, I go into these handicapped adults or kids. They're like a lost society. People forget they even exist. And for me, you know what? I'm telling them a story. I'm taking them places they can't go to. And that's the objective. That's the bottom line. I was doing a Channel 56 auction, and I did it for the first, oh, 10 years in a row. And in 68, I met a guy who, I mean, he and I became friends instantaneously. His name was Bob Talbot. He worked for the Free Press. And we just became buddies. And at the time, the Free Press was on strike. He was here from South Carolina, didn't know a soul. And he met me, and we just became friends. And over the years, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel around with him, have him stand up at my wedding. He was godfather of my child. But I would travel with Bob, and he would sometimes do some things that would just amaze me. He was very generous, but he had like a weird sense of humor. I remember one day we were driving around, and he had this one gentleman, I won't, I won't mention his name, but he would call Bob and threaten him on the phone, tell him what a jerk he is, tell him to go back to South Carolina, ask him why he's here. Well, we were driving one day and he says, Dane, this is where this guy lives. And he sees the free press sitting there and the guy's, shoot, says to me, pull over. I said, what are you gonna do? He says, pull over. So he pulls over, rolls down the window, pulls the guy's free press out, opens up his page, finds his picture, writes a little note, signs it, puts it back in, says, let's get out of here, and he drives away. I said, are you serious? And I mean, I, he and I laughed for 15 minutes about this. Yeah, that's just one of the things he did. But one thing that I learned about Bob, he would do the Special Olympics every year. He would do all these things. He was a very, very, very giving person. And I mean, it wasn't always, I mean, he wouldn't even write about it. I would go out with him on, I don't even want to say how many, but over a thousand trips he and I would take. I really enjoy being able to keep his curiosity, his memory alive with my camera. I've learned so much from him, but one of them was, you can't take it with you, you gotta give it back. And you know what? It's not always monetarily what you get. Sometimes thank you is good enough, the hug is good enough, the kiss is good enough, the thank you is good enough. Everyone has a story. Everybody has a story. You're never going to know it if you don't ask them. So don't miss the opportunity. And you know what? I try not to. My curiosity, without a doubt, comes from Bob. One of the things that amazed me about him, very, very, very rarely, I never saw him write anything down. And I would sit there and read the damn column, and he would have word for word what this person said. 
The saddest thing about Bob is I would bug him for years about writing down his thoughts for a book, for a novel. He would tell me the same thing, I'm gonna do it. Well, he never did, and that saddens me. It saddens me a lot, because he had a lot of great stories and a lot of great memories, and people just won't know about them. I remember sitting with Bob in his basement. We were just talking. He told me about this guy and how he got into taking photographs of nature, Carl Sams and his wife, Jean. And he showed me this book, I believe it was Lost in the Woods. And I was just blown away. I mean, I had never seen pictures of deer like that. I mean, I've seen pictures of deer, but not like that. And I've been so fortunate, I mean, so fortunate to be able to sit with Carl Sams and I mean, a more generous person you couldn't meet as far as with his time, his knowledge, I mean, anyway. But, and just seeing the pictures of the deer really lit a fire under me. And later on, I had hurt my knee mountain biking and I couldn't mountain bike and the doctor told me to walk. And I found this nature trail and I walked and I, you know, I took a camera thinking, you know, not much is gonna happen. And, Little did I know that one day I came across these three deer. And I took a photo of them, they stood there looking at me, and I came close, so I took another photo. It like didn't move. And I was just like blown away. It was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, I'm not Carl Sands, trust me. But I mean, it was like, it was like really cool. And I, every time I would go back out to that trail, I would take my camera, I'd walk, I'd see different things, whether it be flowers, things I never really looked at before. It just, just opened up a whole new world to me because there I was walking because I tore my knee up mountain biking when I fell. I knew I couldn't mountain bike. I knew I couldn't run, but I knew I could walk. I didn't walk much and I would use my monopod and I broke a couple and there were a few deer that laughed at me in the snow when I fell and tried to use it as a cane. But I mean, I would go out in the winter. I went out all year and I walked because I knew I had to build my knee up again because I was going to mountain bike again. But every time I went out, I had my camera and I really got turned on by the deer. They would. For some reason, I don't know why, I would see their tracks in the snow. And I guess they know I'm no threat and they saw me out there a lot. They would let me walk right up to them and take photographs of them. I would get within five to 10 feet of them. And I just found that so fascinating. And I've just continued doing it. I hope people enjoy my photographs of them. When I was real young in school, I can remember doing, they had walks that Danny Thomas would do for St. Jude's, where you would raise money for St. Jude's Hospital. I remember every year doing that. And then around Halloween time, going out for UNICEF, Danny Kay's. I, growing up, I just always enjoyed doing volunteer type work. I also discovered with the technology that I was able to take the photographs that I love taking pictures of whether it's a nature center, a nature trail, a tropical greenhouse, whether it's art fairs, whether it's a memorial of some type, and the look on their faces to be taken to these places, because I know physically they cannot go there, mentally they can't go there, but to see them see this stuff, and to know that a handicapped child is going through a nature trail, that they're actually seeing animals, actually seeing the snow, actually seeing the color changes, seeing the reflection of the leaves in the water, just seeing the stuff I see, a leaf turn colors, and the look on their faces, the smile, or to have an older person see it and tell me how beautiful it is and how much they love it. Afterwards, like a lot of these assisted living centers, some of them, I'll give them the DVD to have it, so that later on, they'll just have it to look at. Because I know when I leave, they're gonna go back to watching whatever TV shows they watch, but if I can give them 45 minutes to an hour of just something pure, take them out of where they're at, take their heads to somewhere else, I'm just trying to take people to places they can't go and bring a little joy to their lives and just make things a little bit better for a few moments. And if I've done that, 
I've accomplished my goal. Look. Oh. You see up through that hole? See? I see moving around. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How did you spot me? I've been coming here for years. Oh. I've got the tail, a mother actually feeding them with the tail sticking out. And that, that was like a year and a half, two years ago. And I've just been coming, I come out here a lot. I would say from the early 60s to 70s, I shot a lot of pictures. From the 70s on, I think I switched over to photographs. And to me, the difference is a picture is just a picture. A photograph is something that leaves an image, conveys a message, conveys a story. Um, I've always enjoyed doing that. Now it's been over 40 years that I've been using either a video camera or a camera to convey messages. I hope that by being able to use what I'm using now, photo montages, I can take my photographs and get them out to people. I want to be able to help people who can't get to see things. And if I can do that and I can convey something to them and show it to them, then I've just done what I want to do. It don't get any better, my brother. It don't get any better. This is about as pretty as it gets. Just come here, sit and think, and of course take photographs. What I'm doing is I'm taking people from where they are, and I'm taking them to Dane's world. Wherever that may be, it's in my head. And as I create it, that's what it is. Dane's world is Dane's world. So if people say to me, well, where did you take that? That sky is like orange and green. That can't be real. I go, well, it was real when I took it, but welcome to Dane's world. Um, not everything's as you see it. I mean, you know what? If you can change things and make it look cool, why not? I mean, you know, it's art. And I have no boundaries. some raccoon and male bonding. I mean, he knows I'm here. I mean, there's no doubt he knows I'm here. I'm not looking to change the world. I just want to make it a little better for some people who, you know what, really don't have it that great. And I guess that's part of Bob Talbert's legacy that I'm leaving him around is that, you know what, try and help people that can't help themselves. I can't write about them, but I can take stuff to them that they can't see. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take it to them. Welcome to Dane's World.